Good evening. Once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video this evening talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. But first, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and love and mercy. Thank you for sending your Son to die for our sins. And thank you for your holy word that helps us grow in you on a daily basis and warns us of the signs of the times. And thank you for your patience and your long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I just ask that you would use this message for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, well, uh, again, I love living in the last days. It is super exciting to watch God's plan taking place. And as I see that day approaching, I'm going to continue to just keep sounding the alarm and trusting that God will use these messages to get them to the people who have ears to hear. Uh, this, the times we're living in are just getting stranger and stranger. I got some stories tonight that will indicate that. Um, you know, if you're if you're out there watching this video right now and and you're not a believer, you're a mocker, you're a scoffer, you're not, you don't believe Bible prophecy is true. I'm here to tell you it is, and I'm also here to tell you that is un, that is that is amazing as it seems, and and some of the things that that are going to happen in Bible prophecy like the rapture of the church, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the one world government, the reign of the Antichrist, the battle of Armageddon, all of that stuff can seem like fairy tales and, and can seem like there's no way it's real. I'm here to tell you it is real and it's all coming to pass and it's coming to pass faster than you can imagine. And because of that again, the, the stories are just getting stranger and stranger and and, uh, you know, all of us that uh, are, are out here on, on YouTube and warning people and, and, and talking about the signs of the times and talking about things like FEMA camps and one world governments and one world religions and beheadings and all of this stuff, Mark, Mark of the Beast, it seems like crazy conspiracy theory, theories. And I'm here to tell you that the people who have been preaching these things and are, are telling you the truth, and it is not. A crazy conspiracy theory, and and uh, I've got a story about a, a conspiracy theory here tonight. I want to go over. I've sat on it for a while, but in light of some recent events, it's time to talk about it a little bit. So with that, let's get into it. Let's go to some scripture real quick, and then get into some news stories. Matthew chapter twenty-four, verses three to eight. And as he sat upon the mount of olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Oh, and verse 12, by the way, says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we are living in those days right now that Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows. And... And uh, we are seeing nation against nation, and wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, and all the signs that he told us to look for on a daily basis. Now, a lot of people say, you know, that's, you're a fear monger by talking about all that. But no, I'm here to give you hope. Jesus told us not to fear, and he gave us all these signs so we would know what was going on, that we would not be in the dark, that we would be children of the light. And that the day would not overtake us as a thief. And I'm going to close in Scripture tonight and going through that Scripture a little later. But let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7-9 through 9 real quick. And it says, 
For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, of, of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we can handle, if you're in Jesus, anything that we have to face here in these last days. And as I said, it's getting crazier and crazier. So let's get into some news stories. Now the first one today I want to go over uh, real quickly is out of the Times of Israel. Um, it says, Tony Blair said is stepping down as the Mideast envoy. It says, a British ex-prime minister to leave role as special envoy but it says he wants to remain involved in peace efforts. Uh, this is just a very interesting article because I got my eye on Tony Blair here in these last days and what kind of role he may play because he is involved in the peace process and he's also involved in, in uh, world, the worldwide ecumenical movement of uh, bringing on a one world religion in hopes of bringing in world peace through that, that method. And uh, with his Tony Blair Faith Foundation. So let's take a look at this. It says Tony Blair is stepping back as envoy for the Middle East Peace Quartet, Middle East Quartet, but wants to remain part of the peace process. The quartet, sometimes called the Diplomatic Quartet of, or the Madrid Quartet, was created after the 1991 Madrid Conference. It is compri comprised of representatives from four groups: the United States, the United Nations, European Union, and Russia that attempt to mediate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, on Saturday, the former British Prime Minister reportedly met with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in the Red Sea Resort city of Sharam al-Sheikh to discuss a job change. According to the newspaper, Blair also spoke with U.N. Foreign Policy Chief Federica Mogherini. Uh, he has served as envoy to the quartet for nearly eight years. Now, it says, though, while trying to recast his role, Blair is determined to remain part of the peace process, according to the newspaper, which said an announcement of his new role could come later this week. That's what's interesting. He's, he says he's stepping down, yet he's going to still be part of the peace process, just a new role, and uh, an interesting week, if, he, if, if they're going to announce that, along with the Israeli elections, along with... Uh, the lunar, excuse me, the solar eclipse, just prior to Passover and the third blood moon, there's so much going on, and I think it's very uh, important to just kind of continue to watch what Tony Blair is up to as it pertains to the one world religion and the peace process in the Middle East. All right. Netanyahu, Herzog would give Palestinians capital in East Jerusalem. This is also out of the Times of Israel. Remember, the election is on Tuesday in Israel. Uh, let me just try to highlight some of this article. Uh, so thousands of right-wing supporters crowded into Tel Aviv's Rabin Square on Sunday evening, uh, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu focused on the fate of Jerusalem. Under the banner Uniting for the Sake of the Land of Israel, Netanyahu was joined by Economy Minister Naftali Bennett. Um, the rally drew an estimated 25,000 participants. Uh, Netanyahu warned of the real danger that a left-wing government will take power after Tuesday's elections. Uh, Our rivals are investing a huge effort to harm me and the... Uh, Likud to open a gap between my party, the Likud, uh, and our rivals. This is a fateful struggle, a close struggle. One, we must close the gap. It is, it is possible to close the gap. Now, going down here, he says that uh, he also panned Zippy Livni, who jointly leads the Zionist Union, list together with Isaac Her Herzog, saying she had condemned government decisions to build in Jew Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem that are located in the east of the capital. And I ask, 
If Jews can't build in Jerusalem, where can they build? Netanyahu said, and went on to claim that Herzog intends to see Jerusalem serve as the capital for the Jews and Palestinians. Under a Herzog-Livni government, he said, the capital of a Palestinian state will be established in East Jerusalem. Now, they're trying to hide it, he asserted, but this is their real position. Keep in mind that East Jerusalem is where the holy sites are in the Temple Mount. But, like I said, if Benjamin Netanyahu does not get re-elected, there's a strong chance that whoever does will agree to the two-state solution and the dividing of the land of Israel and, quite frankly, dividing Jerusalem. Uh, so, I know, again, I quote this scripture a lot, uh, but, again, I get new viewers every day and just apply. So, let's go back again. Zechariah chapter 12. Verses uh, 2 and 3. Zechariah 12. Verses 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. The Bible makes it clear that in the end, the entire world is going to turn against Israel and come up against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, trying to wipe out the Jewish people. And God is going to fight for them. But uh, again, we can see all these things Wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, coming together right now. Uh, speaking of that, out of the year Rosh Sheva today, uh, Hamas says it's a holy obligation to attack Israel from Judea and Samaria. It says, even as Hamas claims to be discussing a long-term quiet period, it is planning to open a front against Israel in Judea and Samaria. Uh, <clears throat> even as Hamas claims to be discussing a long-term quiet period in which it will promise not to attack Israel for five years in exchange for being allowed to develop Gaza economically, top Hamas terrorists were planning their next round of battle against Israel to be launched from Judea and Samaria. In an interview with Hamas, al Aqsa TV, uh, top Hamas terrorist Mahmoud Azar said that negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority have failed, and now it was the turn of the terror groups to try and make some progress to free all of Palestine. The way to do this, he said, was to set up well-armored terror cells in Judea and Samaria so that a two-pronged attack from Israel south and east could take place. For that, he said, there would be a need to smuggle weapons from Gaza to PA-controlled areas of Judea and Samaria, a task Hamas is already working on. We have a holy obligation to move the struggle to the West Bank, said Azar. We also support our sons and daughters, the heroes of the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, who are holding on to it day and night, and who have invented new weapons to fight the occupation. Does that sound like there's going to be peace? sounds a lot more like the Psalm 83 war when a confederacy of radical jihadist and you know, Muslim nations try to attack Israel to wipe them off the map. That the name of Israel be remembered no more. Uh, and here's another story about a different terror group. But this is interesting because this is about Hezbollah fighting ISIS. This is uh, and and we know that Iran now is getting involved in that. Uh, of course, Iran supports Hezbollah. So here we are, out of the Rut Shove report, Hezbollah to send hundreds of fighters to Iraq. Lebanese Shia terrorist group to send at least 800 elite fighters to battle ISIS in northern Iraq. The Lebanese Shia terrorist group Hezbollah is preparing to send hundreds of its men to fight ISIS in Iraq, further expanding the Iranian proxy's footprint in the turbulent region. 
According to the London-based pan-Arab paper, the Al Arabi Al Jadid, the Shia Islamist group is to send at least 800 fighters to bolster anti-ISIS forces as they prepare for a long-awaited offensive against the Islamic State stronghold of Mosul, Iraq's second largest city after Baghdad. Hezbollah has already sustained significant casualties fighting alongside regime troops and other pro-regime militias in Syria against both ISIS and other rebels. If true, such a major deployment in Iraq will further stretch its capacity at a time when Hezbollah is also struggling financially. It will also further raise tensions within Lebanon itself, where opposition members have accused Hezbollah of dragging the country into the Syrian civil war and whose Sunni Muslim community has long accused the powerful terrorist group of waging war against Sunnis on, Iran, on Iran's behalf. Uh, again, we've got all these different factions of, of uh, Muslim terrorist groups fighting each other. We have the uh, so-called Muslim, moderate Muslim nations getting involved, saying that we need to eradicate the world of, of the radical terrorism. We have a president in the White House who won't even use the phrase radical terrorism. And the, the Middle East is absolutely on fire and about to explode. Uh, let's, and here's, here's bringing about the, the Iran uh, nuclear deal. This is out of the Arut Sheva today as well. Senate Majority Leader warns a very bad Iran deal is close. Now, Barack Hussein Obama wants to make a deal so bad, and he really doesn't care about the security of Israel, and unfortunately, I'm not so sure he cares about the security of the United States of America either. Senate Majority Leader warns a very bad Iran deal is close. Uh, Senate, Senator Mitch McConnell defends Republicans' letter to Iran says Kerry meddled in Reagan's foreign policy, too. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell defended on Sunday the letter he and 46 other Republican senators sent to Iran's leaders on Monday in which they informed Iranian leaders that any deal they signed with the Obama administration would serve only as an executive agreement that could be revoked by a future president. Uh, but president Obama and Secretary John of State John Kerry have claimed that the letter is Sorry, darn it, Google crashed again. It was going so well. One moment. All right. Oh, that the letter was unprecedented and that it undermines negotiations with the Islamic Republic. But McConnell insisted in an interview with CNN that the administration was exhibiting a good case of selective outrage and noted that as a senator, Kerry met with Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega during the Sandinista conflict between Nicaragua and the U.S. under then-President Ronald Reagan. McConnell also pointed out that former majority, Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd uh, flew to Moscow in 1979 to tell Russian officials that the Senate could block the SALT II nuclear treaty, which was then being discussed. I don't think it was, mis it was a mistake, he said about the letter. It's no more unusual than Robert Byrd going to Moscow or John Kerry going to Nicaragua. The president is about to make what we believe is a very bad deal. He doesn't clearly want Congress involved at all, and we're worried about it. The president would like to keep us out of it. We know that. All this is a distraction away from the point here, McConnell said, repeating that the Obama administration is about to sign a very bad deal with one of the worst regimes in the world. It specifically inserts itself directly to the leader of another country, saying, Don't negotiate with these guys because we're going to change this, Kerry said in an interview. It is incorrect because they cannot change the executive agreement. Um... <clears throat> You know, again, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, perilous times. The United States government is, is broke. Our nation is collapsing. It's losing all of its influence within the world. America's turning against Israel, getting ready to force Israel into a two-state solution, campaigning against Benjamin Netanyahu right now. 
kicking God out of society and bringing the Muslim and you know bringing Islam into our schools into our country bringing Islam into the national cathedral for a prayer meeting while removing God the true God from society our nation's days are numbered the handwriting is on the wall and the new world order will rise soon now Interestingly, here's what uh, some of the uh, pro Likud campaign people are saying about our president, who again is has his people over there campaigning against Benjamin Netanyahu. This is out of the Jerusalem Post. Uh, it says a uh, pro Likud campaign call call warns voters of Hussein Obama. I love it. Campaigner said the voters should remember that Hussein Obama is in the White House and only a strong Likud can stand up to him. A pro-Likud campaign phone call seeking to get out the vote among supporters referred to the U.S. President as Hussein Obama. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and U.S. President Barack Obama have had a notoriously tense relationship. The relationship hit its nadir two weeks ago when Netanyahu, at the invitation of Republican House Speaker John Boehner, uh, addressed Congress. In the phone call made at, to a Jerusalem Post reporter, the campaigner warned that polls put Likud close to the Zionist Union and failure of Likud supporters to vote in Tuesday's election could end in a government led by the competing party's leaders, Isaac Herzog and Zippy Livni. The campaigner said that voters should remember that Hussein Obama is in the White House and only a strong Likud could stand up to him before asking whether we can count on your vote uh, on Election Day. When told that referring to the U.S. President as Hussein Obama was insulting, the caller responded, Why? The use of Obama's middle name in the U.S. has been politically contentious, with Obama supporters accusing detractors of using it to raise questions about his religion, foment distrust, and highlight his otherness. <laughs> it remains... Uh, let me skip over that. Um, that's enough on that anyway. I just... First of all, that is his name, Barack Hussein Obama, who has done everything he can to support Palestinians in the two-state solution and constantly turn against Israel, speak out against Christianity while praising the Koran and praising Islam. Hey, his name speaks for itself. His actions speak louder than his words. His refusal to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu when he came here to speak to Congress while campaigning against him speaks certainly volumes. Barack Hussein Obama, by all indications, is a Muslim who supports the Palestinian effort and does not want Benjamin Netanyahu, who is a strong leader, to be reelected. And again, like I said, that's going stuff like this is going to lead to the destruction of America. All right, here's an interesting story out of the Jerusalem Post today. Uh, it says, Jesus had a brother, question mark. It's possible. Yes, Jesus had a brother. He had more than one brother, and he had sisters. And I'm going to go to some scripture in a minute, but that's what the basis of this article is. Uh, out of the Jerusalem Post. And anybody else think it odd? Again, all these biblical movies, most of them not very biblical, but still biblical-type movies. Uh, CNN tonight's got the uh, Finding Jesus show on. They've had one about... Uh, John the Baptist last week. The week before that was about the Shroud of Turin. This week's about Judas. Um, we got the AD series coming on. It's just very interesting how much Jesus Christ is in the news these days. Why? Because he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he is soon coming back to this earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. And there are warnings being given because Jesus is long-suffering and does not want anyone to perish. He's trying to get your attention. Now, most of these shows, I, they frustrate me when I watch them on TV. But still, Jesus is in the news 
like never before. It's the strangest thing. And it tell it just we're living in the last days and there's spiritual warfare going on like crazy. And this is an interesting article. It says Jesus had a brother brother, question mark, it's possible. So scholars claim that James is the son of Mary and thus the brother of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to this, Catholics? New archaeological reports and claims from biblical scholar Ben Withering show that Jesus may have had a brother. Withering is also a New Testament professor uh, from Asbury Theological Seminary, as well as an ordained pastor, recently debunked a long-held claim that Jesus was Mary's only child, stating to CNN that James was the brother of Jesus Christ. The claims follow a 2002 archaeological discovery of a 2,000-year-old bone box with the Aramaic description, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. The unique discovery backs up suspicions that Jesus was not only was not an only child based on the biblical passage referring to Jesus' brothers and sisters. The biblical verse in question, Mark 6, 3, says, Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? Further evidence is found in the letter Paul wrote to the Galatians. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. For centuries, religious scholars have disputed whether or not the reference to brothers and sisters was literal or figurative. Withering stated that it is very possible that Mary went on to have children after the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. The New Testament says nothing about Mary being a perpetual virgin, Withering said. It says she virginally conceived Jesus, and it certainly implies that she went on to have more children after that, and his brothers and sisters are, in fact, his brothers and sisters. Amen to that. Well, let's, they quote a few verses, but let's go to one more passage of Scripture, because it's clear, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Mary had other children. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, let's read verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For what, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the, uh, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Now the most important verse here, relative to jo Joseph and Mary, and whether they had other children, is verse 25. And, and I've had this debate with Catholics on numerous occasions, and they just ignore this verse altogether. And it says simply, okay, for back to verse 24, and the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Knew her not, until she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, the Bible is very particular, and it says what it means to say. It has no mistakes in it. It, sa it says what it means to say, and it, and it means what it says. And, and it, So there's two very important words here. Till, knew her not until, and firstborn son. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It does not say that Jesus was Mary's only son. It says, brought forth her firstborn son. There is no confusion there. The confusion comes from 
false doctrine within the Catholic Church and the papacy and their early church fathers who make these declarations and popes decide on a whim that you know, I'm speaking as cathedral, I'm infallible, and hey, this is what the, the truth is, and the church just accepts it, even when it goes directly against Scripture. All right, uh, but just again, just a very interesting story. Um, two more news stories real quick. The last one I want to get into is a, has a conspiracy theory that I want to get into, but first let's go to one more news story about the Temple Mount and the election. It says, election ploy, uh, is this an elect election ploy, question mark, Minister Erden softens stand on the Temple Mount. Keep in mind that last week or two weeks ago, the a Jewish court ruled that the Jews must be allowed to pray on the Temple Mount. Uh, Yehuda Glick, was, you know, they tried to assassinate him last summer, a Temple Mount activist, he lived, um, just rioting on the Temple Mount all the time. The Jewish people would like to be able to go up on the Temple Mount and pray. There is no temple there. There has not been one since A.D. 70. Now, the Temple Mount's in the news all the time. Jerusalem is now a cup of trembling, a burdensome stone. We're heading into the final seven-year period of time. Covenant with many, Daniel 9, 27. There will be a temple in Jerusalem. The Antichrist will desecrate it. Three and a half years into it, but there will be a temple. Revelation 11, 1 and 2. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Jesus refers to it in Matthew 24, 15. There will be a temple. This is three days before the election. Interior Minister Erden says, Criticism of policy on Jewish prayer is justified. It says, Rules may change. In an interview published three days before the election, Interior Minister Erden said that Criticism of the government's policy on Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount is justified. Erdin uh, blamed Yisrael uh, Betenu, whose minister, Yitzhak Haranovich, was public security minister in the outgoing government for the discrimination against Jews and voiced hope that the next government will take a different track, tack. The interviewer for the weekly um, told Erdogan that under the Likud government, it has become much more difficult for Jews to pray at the Temple Mount. Erdogan replied that the criticism is justified, and I too have criticism on this matter. However, he continued, the public minist security ministry was held by Israel Betanyu, as you remember. Erdogan claimed that he has raised the issue of Temple Mount prayer several times. I asked the minister for public for public security several times about the discriminatory practices that the Israeli police instituted here uh, when there were those pictures of the Jews who were attacked. That is one of the issues that need to be improved on the Mount, and I hope that we improve them in the next government. Erdogan's statements notwithstanding, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said on Friday that he will continue the present policy for fear that a religious war between Muslims and Jews could break out otherwise. But again, I have to ask, the whole world keeps talking about tolerance, unity, again, tolerance, peace, harmony. When is the Antichrist going to step in, guarantee Israel's security, allow them to build their temple, and, and, and restore their rights to the Temple Mount? It's just a matter of time. God's timing. <laughs> By all indications, we're getting really, really close. All right, this last news story. It's been a controversial subject since it happened on September 11th when we got attacked that, uh, you know, that the, the American government was complicit in it. Now, I've uh, studied it, looked at it for years. I don't know what all to believe, but I certainly believe we don't have the truth. We, don't, we aren't getting the true story. And I also know that the New World Order is rising, and their their plan is order through chaos. And there's just so many weird things uh, about 9-11 and Building 7, the collapse of buildings. And the fact that the collapse of all the buildings, for that matter. Um, so what's interesting, the reason I'm bringing this up is with Vladimir Putin this past week, people wondering whether he's dead, where he's at, what's going on. Uh, 
the relationship between Obama and, and Putin and what's going on with the Ukraine and Crimea and, and, and whether we're going to arm Ukraine and the, the threats of war because of that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to bring this up. This is out of Veterans Today. Pravda, Putin threatens to release satellite evidence of 9-11. Now, this is a story that actually came out on February 10th. I've been sitting on it. Uh, somebody else brought it to my attention. I think it was Naomi, as a matter of fact. Thank you, Naomi. Um, but uh, I'm bringing it up because of the, the week that we've had with Vladimir Putin in the news. Uh, that and the fact that I'm telling you 2015 is just going to be such a huge year. And uh, if this is true what Putin is going to do, it's going to shake this country and quite frankly the world. It says, U.S. fears Russian publication of satellite photos of the tragedy of 9-11. American, American experts believe that despite the fact that relations between the U.S. and Russia reached the worst point since the Cold War, Putin delivered until Obama only minor troubles. Analysts believe that this is the calm before the storm. Putin is going to hit once, but he's going to hit hard. Russia is preparing the release of evidence of the involvement of the U.S. government and intelligence services in the September 11th attacks. The list of evidence includes satellite images. Published material can prove the U.S. government complic the U.S. government complicitly in the 9-11 attacks and the successful manipulation of public opinion. The attack was planned by the U.S. government but exercised using her proxy so that an attack on America and the people of the United States looked like an act of, ag of aggression by an international terrorist organization. The motive for deception and murder of its own citizens served U.S. soil, in, excuse me, U.S. oil interests, and the Middle East state corporations. The evidence will be so convincing that it utterly debunks the official 9/11 cover story, supported by the U.S. government. Russia proves that America is no stranger to using false flag terrorism against its citizens, in order to achieve a pretext for military intervention in a foreign country. In the case of the September 11th attacks, the evidence will be conclusive satellite imagery. If successful, the consequences of Putin's tactics would expose the U.S. government's secret terrorist policies. The government's credibility would be undermined and should bring about mass protests in the cities, leading to an uprising, according to American analysts. And as the United States will look on the, the and as the United States will look on the political world arena. The validity of Americans' position as a leader in the fight against international terrorism will be totally undermined, giving immediate advantage to rogue states and Islamic terrorists. The actual development of the situation could be much worse, experts warn. Again, I keep saying, America is going to fall. I believe America is going to fall very, very soon. This news could certainly help... Ex exacerbate that. Uh, wow. Guys, we're living in the last days. The And America does have to fall for the one world, new world order to rise. It's in place. It's, you know, the Club of Rome has the world divided into the ten regions already. The United States will be part of region number one, I believe, and it would, it's the United States, Canada, and Mexico. No longer just the United States. That's why the borders are open. That's why they aren't trying to close the borders. There's a one world government. There's a one world religion coming. They will be headed up by the Antichrist and the false prophet. I know for most of you out there, if you are not a believer, you think that's crazy. I'm here to tell you, and a lot of other people are telling you the same thing. It is the truth. It's what God's word says, and it's happening exactly like God's word said it would. We are living in the last days. So the very important question is, are you saved? Do you know for sure that you have salvation? If you do not, today is the day of salvation. You do not want to be left behind. You do not, for sure, want to die in your sin. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Excuse me, no man comes to the Father but 
by me. There are not many paths like the world likes to believe. So Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey one day said, it, it can't be possible if there's just one path. It's not possible. Yes, Oprah, it is possible. That's the truth. The New World Order, the, the New Age movement, the there are many paths to the... We all worship the same God as a lot, one of Satan's favorite lies, I can assure you. Jesus Christ died to save you. And he rose again, conquering sin and death. And he promised to come back again. And all of the signs he gave us are here. And the Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Turn to him in faith while you still can. He is coming back soon. Make sure you're ready. And keep looking up. God bless everyone.